Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode three of Out of Character, the show where your favorite creators drop out of character for an hour to talk with game designer and host Mark Tassin, that would be me, uh, about their art, their process, and the nerdy stuff that inspires them. From the secrets behind their craft, to the ins and outs of the business, to the games, shows, and books that they just can't get enough of, it's a unique and candid look at the folks who create the stuff that you and I love. Now, comments are going to be open throughout the show, and although we can't make promises, we'll probably pull in a few of your comments and questions as we go along. So without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce Out of Character's guest, Eric Nunnally. Hi, Eric. Welcome to the show. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. I'm very excited to have you here. Hey, um, for folks who maybe haven't encountered your work before, just tell me a little bit about yourself and about your work and the, the things you've created. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, I have kind of a what I consider to be a slightly strange background in that uh, where I grew up, there wasn't um, I wasn't surrounded by like a culture of reading. So my interest in genre stuff tended to take a, a slightly different route, you know, so that I, I grow mm. up and I, I meet a bunch of other people that are doing this stuff. And it's not all the things that I read. I kind of missed <laughs> all the things that you're supposed to have read when you were growing up. <laughs> Um, anyway, that led to, you know, I, I went from there into the military and after the military, I went to art school um, and I ended up with a graphic design degree. Um, and I, I'm just I've, I've always been really interested in 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 um, what I've come to understand to just be storytelling. Right. It started with comic strips and then comic books and then novels and short stories and all kinds of things like that. So it was just a weird eclectic interest. Um, you know, I did combat sports. Um, I, I enjoyed running 5k obstacle courses. So it's like, you know, this very, uh, the, the dichotomy between like this very, uh, non-physical thing <laughs> with all these yeah, other right. things. Yeah. So I've always enjoyed writing action and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where my interest lay. Well, you know, that's interesting because uh, a lot of folks who write, they aren't necessarily the most physical people. It's just, it's kind of a stereotype that is often true. It's folks who don't necessarily, would prefer to just sit quietly in a corner than actually get up and do something. And yet you've got a really physical, a very active past. Yeah, yeah, definitely an active past. Now that I'm, yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> starting to catch up with me. And and I really, the last, what I've been doing the last, three or four years or so, especially during the pandemic is, is maintenance. Yeah. You know, I just, I want my heart to continue to beat. I want my lungs to be strong. I want to be able to go up crazy. and down stairs. Yeah. Crazy <laughs> stuff like that. Really over the top. Yeah, I know. Just nuts. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny talking about action and, and physicality. One of the things I want to talk about is you have a book called lightning wears a red cape mm -hmm. and it's a superhero story. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things that struck me when I started reading about it and learning about your books is that I think that writing superhero action in prose is really hard. And I'm wondering like, how did you approach that? What did you do to approach it? So you could sort of take what is typically a very, well, almost completely visual concept and turn it into prose on the page and still capture that action. Mm -hmm. Well, the ideas for that drive this book have been uh, they've been banging around in my head since college so uh, i remember um i actually have it in my in another office uh, um, i drew this big picture in 1997 of, of all these characters that mm -hmm. i had come up with since i was in middle school and um what i'd always wanted as much as i loved comics and stuff I, there were a lot of things that i didn't like about them like do you, you know patrolling to find crime and you <laughs> yeah. know the, the, uh, you know, women are almost always very overexposed in bikinis and stuff and i'm like nobody goes into combat in a tank top etc cetera, etc cetera. <laughs> so, yeah this, so this, the, the cynicism of growing up you know along with you know this this pure joy of, of these things so I, I what i did with that book really was not think of them as superheroes right in mm -hmm. anything of the traditional sense these are people with abilities and, and we've seen a number of um, books and shows about people who have these abilities and how they get mixed up in trouble and stuff mm -hmm. like that and I, I just really wanted to um to tinker with the aspect of the fear of 
uh, people developing abilities like, you know, superhuman abilities and what that might mean somewhat legally mm -hmm. in terms of uh, civil rights and stuff, because uh, another trope that I always hated was suddenly there's, you know, all the black helicopters and the secret government <laughs> programs and things like that. Like nobody has that going on. Um, <laughs> so in my book, they, they don't know what to do. There's no yeah. legislation that governs it. As long as you're not breaking laws, yeah. you know, there's, there's nothing to be done about it. So everybody's deathly afraid of someone developing an ability to do some serious crime. And right. of course, that's what happens, right? So that's an inflection point. And so no capes, basically. It's, it's, despite yeah. it's called Lightning Wears Red Cape. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, that's a reference to um, there's a uh, what's ostensibly a god in the mm -hmm. book. Uh, from Yoruba legend is essentially the thunder god of Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, red is one of those colors, uh, one of the colors associated with 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 that aspect. And, and you know, he's wearing this red cloak um, that's mm. much as much a cape as possible. But no one else wears capes or anything. Right, right. <laughs> but I mean, it gives the impression of that as you're sort of going along. It sort of strikes some of those uh, those chords that we all have, that sort of collective subconscious of, what we're looking for to sort of trigger us and tell us this is a superhero story. These are the yeah. things that we can expect. Exactly. And, and uh, that particular character is the one who's the most like over the top of something. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I just didn't think of them as superheroes. I thought of them as people with abilities and how that might alter how you think about going about your life, because not everybody like, you, you know, someone who wants to be a painter would still want to be a painter probably mm -hmm. if they had super strength. <laughs> right, mean, exactly. Yeah, you're not going to go out and fight crime necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, and I think that's really interesting because on one hand, you know, you're still going to have those action scenes. You're still going to have that that physicality. Yeah. But when you think about it that way, there's so much more to talk about than just how the fist flew through the air, right? And yeah. I think that, I don't know if you've ever heard Kevin Feige talk about his MCU approach, and he said, we're not making superhero movies, we're making movies that happen to star superheroes. So we made a spy movie that happened to have superheroes in it, and a, right. a heist movie that happened to have superheroes in it. And it, right. it was an interesting approach, I thought. I learned a lot from that idea. Yeah, I think the uh, the the graveyard that is comic books, you know, they're trying to churn out so much stuff per month. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I always thought it was a bad idea to have a monthly comic, right? I, I think it's better to have, you know, a, a very structured arc that's, you know, five, four, six, ten, twelve issues. And that's one volume. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it's something that someone has thought through. So we would occasionally get stories like that in the Marvel universe in particular earlier than DC. Yeah. And that's what they're mining for all these, these MCU movies, right? They're mining all that right. good material, not all that filler that they came up with. And that good yeah. stuff had everything to do with people. Yeah. I wonder though, you know, if there's a place for both, right? Cause there's sort of this sense of, you know, you want to have that really nice, great dinner, but at the same time, it's nice to go to McDonald's and get a Big Mac. Right. And and it's the same every time, you know, what to expect it's a little different, but it's just good or to get a quarter pounder at, or uh, get a, a, a Whopper at Burger King. Right. 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 It's almost like I kind of feel like I want both of those things. I want to have my rich, deep storytelling, my one shot storylines that go from start to finish and have a really well thought out tale. And and still, I want to have my Big Mac. So that's I don't right. know. There's, there's going to be some explosive action in there somewhere. And, and that's. Um, a lot of the the way I write uh, is I imagine a number of scenes, and when I can't escape that, then I have to mm -hmm. start thinking about how those scenes are strung together. But it usually right. starts out with some significant, you know, action, some kind of violence, uh, you know, something's going completely wrong. But how do you get there, and how do you make it matter? Yeah. So I'm a huge comic book fan. I should just tell you, I'm a huge comic. In fact, this arrived in the mail today. I'm showing this because Matt Forbeck was our guest a couple of weeks ago. And this is the new role playing game that he wrote and designed. Uh, it just came out today and arrived on the doorstep. That's cool. um, but I'm sort of wondering, you know, you talk about these sort of enclosed story arcs. What is what are some of those or what are one of those that you can think of that you thought was really impactful, that you really liked what they did with it? Uh, most recently, that would be the Immortal Hulk. Okay. Yeah, the, um, what's his name? 
of course, I'm just sitting on top of all of this stuff. Aren't we all? I mean, <laughs> you can't see what's on the other side of here, but it's all gaming stuff and comics and things. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, right. You, Al Ewing and, and Joe Bennett, and the art is fantastic, right? Yeah. Um, it's it's just amazing, and they they really get into a lot of body horror in the book, um, mm. and they're also mining some of that good stuff from the Hulk's past, all while redefining it. And it's um, it it's not, it's an arc, yeah. Because once that team finished what they were doing, it's off to the other team, um, which. You know, unfortunately, I don't think it's as good, but but this one I thought was excellent because it, it really got into the uh, some of the core aspects of Bruce Banner's fractured personality and his poor relationship, poor relationships with everyone. But as well as the, you know, the Big Mac stuff, redefining what gamma means and, and how they're all related and, and how it's connected. Right. The really over the top stuff on top of dealing with the. Uh, this conversation between these fractured psyches and how they all get along. So that, yeah, that was great. Yeah. Well, I think that's really cool because I am currently endeavoring to read Marvel starting from the beginning and I'm up to 1974 at this point. And something that is like absolutely true to Hulk is what you were just talking about, that destruction of all the relationships around him. Right. Yeah. And that's true right back to the very beginning. And so I think that's interesting because in those older comics, they had maybe one or two panels to say anything about that, right? Then they had to get back to punching things. That's right. But yeah. it's cool that we're getting to a point with comics that people can tell these sort of deeper, more thought out stories. It's yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, and it was just a nod at it in the MCU too, because yeah. I know it's all licensing. That's the problem with really exploring the Hulk. But where he becomes a sort of a different character, basically through therapy, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is which is his problem, right? He has this <laughs> traumatic past, you know. But then you still get the the big explosive fights and stuff, and you know, and and uh, also neat the difference uh, between what those conflicts are like before the change, like before he gets his um. Uh, gets his therapy on and sort of yeah. brings things together. You know, the, the chaos is different, which mm -hmm. is you know, another way to freshen things up. Well, and I think that's one thing that is always a challenge is how do you tell the, the story of a character everyone knows while still making it new yeah, and yet still being recognizable? Because when you go too far in that direction, people are like going, you wrecked it. You ruined my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, well, so how yeah. do you walk that line, right? Yeah, I think anyone who reads comics, um, anyone who reads comics honestly, yeah, frankly, is uh, shouldn't be taking <laughs> that you ruined my childhood, that all that emotional <laughs> like I'm going to destroy this company for doing this with my thing. It's <laughs> like they'll come around. Don't worry, it's just one story. You know, everything gets rebooted. Nobody actually dies except what I'm. Uh, Ben Parker. <laughs> yeah, right. Every time. Every time. <laughs> he stays <Poor> dead. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone comes back except for Ben. That's right. Um, so let me ask, when you were doing Lightning Wears a Red Cape, how did you play with some of those tropes? How did you dig into some of those ideas? What were some of those concepts that you wanted to explore? Mm -hmm. um, well, let's see. The... It's a it's a broadcast, um, uh, and there's no uh, in a lot of ways there's no main character. Mm -hmm. The character we start with has a uh, um, has been introduced to violence, and his his core problem is that he's very good at it, and he doesn't necessarily want to be in situations to for that to happen, but. Uh, he he craves it in a way, right? Yeah. He craves this this kind of very physical violence. And then there's another character who you know he can fly. He's super strong. He's like Superman. He's not terribly smart, and he has mm -hmm. a lot of insecurities about what his abilities are going to be. You know, there's there's a pair of characters from Puerto Rico that are trying to redefine what it means to be, you know, a, a superhero of some sort. Uh, and one of them is carrying the guilt of almost almost killing someone in the ring. Mm -hmm. uh, she she used to do MMA fighting and 
you know, manifested and it almost took this person's head off. And, you know, so sort of regularly she visits this person and talks to them. Um, so, yeah, in and, and, and ways like that. And then you know, criminals having really, you know, our, our monsters, our real monsters are made. You know, no yeah. one's just born bad necessarily. <laughs> um, right. You give them the right environment and poor guidance and, and you get this thing. And, and that's, you know, where the criminals come from. So that crops up as well. It's not just about I'm doing this because I can. I'm mm -hmm. doing this for more complex reasons than just I can throw a lightning bolt. So that makes me top guy around here. You know, especially in the older comics uh, and modern comics as well. But I've always been sort of interested by, despite the fact that I've made very clear I love this stuff, the reality is that everyone is so comfortable with violence as the solution to their problems. They're yeah. so comfortable with it. And there's no real repercussions for what that does to people on both sides of that, right? right, on both. right. And, and I guess the third side too, those people observing some of those things, what that does to them. Mm -hmm. I do think it's interesting that that doesn't get explored very much. It's yeah, um, by the it's one of the, one of the core things that I like to do with stories. Um, if because I enjoy doing serialized stuff, like I don't mind doing multiple adventures. But mm -hmm. I, I think your your main character should show some wear and tear by the end of whatever you're doing. So all of these characters are not in a great place by the end of the book. Like <laughs> their their whole <laughs> worldviews are being redefined in some in awful ways. Um, because like the number one thing that everybody was afraid of in, in the book was someone developing mental powers mm -hmm. and and the main threat has this ability to uh control your emotions essentially yeah. so like a projecting empath but also mm -hmm. a reading empath and he and uh, he kind of feeds on it he's something of a vampire so he's yeah. he's an addict essentially <laughs> and yeah. not to forgive him he's definitely an awful person but He's, he's right. getting into people's emotions. And by the end of the book, there's there's fallout from that, like a lot of fallout from that, that, that uh, some of the characters are carrying. So, yeah, there, there should be consequences to engaging in these things. That's and not, not everybody in the book wants to do this shit either. Uh, there's one character who's incredibly powerful and has absolutely no interest in doing superhero stuff. She's trying to put her life back together because when she manifested it, you know, created a problem, but now she's trying to get it back together. So right. not always bang. That's great. I mean, that, well, it's not great. It's great that you explored that idea. Um, so folks should definitely check that out. Um, but you were talking about damaged characters, and I guess that kind of gives me a good segue into the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is that you do a fair amount of what folks would call horror or you know, if it would fall in, if you had to put it on a shelf somewhere, that's where it would end up a lot of times. I know yep. you've got a couple of novels uh, about uh, character Alexander Smith, Blood for the Sun is one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, this, the other one is All the Dead Men. One of the things I heard you say elsewhere was just talking about how that idea of watching how these experiences chew away at the person and the damage they walk away with at the end i think anyone who's ever played the call call of cthulhu role-playing game recognizes <laughs> this um what is it about that that you find so interesting i find a character that has some irredeemable aspect to be incredibly compelling as long as they're swimming against that aspect for whatever mm -hmm. reason, right yeah. there's any number of reasons why you might turn the corner on something like that but there's some decisions that you make that you can't take back and you cannot mm -hmm. compensate for. Um, yeah. So they're, they're kind of, they're essentially doomed. Um, and I don't know. I just, I just really like that. And that's Alexander in these books is, is one of those characters, right? He's, he's been around since, um, since the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. um, his memories are fragmented and he did something awful uh, in, in a heated moment that he shouldn't have. It's a decision, you know, it was a revenge decision where he actually murders a child mm -hmm. um, in retaliation for someone murdering children and part of a group that, that he was a part of. And now this child mm. literally haunts him. Um, mm. But you can't fix that. There's no, there's no getting away from it. Right? There's other horrible things that he's done and there's no, there's no coming back from it. So it's, it's just a tortured yeah. character. It's interesting because I think a lot of the the best literary concepts that people will dive into and that really tell compelling stories 
are the ones that we all struggle with. And it is sort of explores that. The idea of, are there things that we've done that we can never be forgiven for? Are there things that, that we've done that, you know, you can't undo? And right. how, does, how do you forgive yourself, much less anyone else forgive you, right? Yeah, yeah. and who knows? Like, literally, who knows? And, and yeah. is that something that you discuss or that you ever admit to yourself? Like, if you never admit it to yourself, that's a different kind of torture. It's another, if you're painfully aware of it and never share it uh, with anybody. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Who, and hopefully, for most of us, it's not murdering a child, but we're <laughs> 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 not... not uh, vampires of sorts being around yeah that's that's uniquely yeah. horrible but yeah you know, uniquely, I, I, like, but I think that's what's kind of fun right i mean you take that idea and say what if you just magnify it yeah. to a point where it's almost uh it makes it easier to sort of wrap your head around it if it's not quite so subtle as the things yeah. we actually deal with yeah I, and i have a lot of fun with um you know because i i grew up reading so many comic books and you know i mostly enjoyed science fiction and of course read a bunch of fantasy and stuff and yeah mm -hmm. you know I, I love the idea of taking the types of things that we're talking about and adding that very over-the-top fantastic angle right that's, yeah that's where the the sci-fi fantasy horror stuff really leans into it and you know the funny thing is the um as as much as a monster story will fit into the horror genre it's it's not necessary that's not necessarily horror right it's yeah because the horror is a, a feeling um it's something that you're experiencing it's not it's not something that's just tangible so like mm -hmm. you know it's <laughs> the basic similarity between romance and horror like these are experiences yeah it's almost i mean to a large extent a lot of monster horror is really just action yeah. where where your enemy is a is a monster but it's not it's not truly horror it's not the thing that sort of burrows down into you and yeah. leaves you with that uncomfortable feeling right exactly it's the experience with something like that that should change the character right you go you yeah. go uh there's a movie sweetheart have you mm -hmm. ever seen this i haven't seen it yet no oh well, it's it's a great movie um and it's mostly one person dealing with this thing that lives on this island she's stranded on this mm -hmm. island and has to deal with this thing and she's a very different person from when she arrives by the end of the movie because of her experiences and those experiences what's dribbled throughout um so there's there is of course the action and the dread and the thrills and the anticipation and stuff but it's really <laughs> about her development um as a person Mm -hmm. uh, to the end of the movie and you know that's what i that's why i thought it was it's such a great movie it's very underrated huh very cool i'll have to check that one out adding it to my list of <laughs> uh things to consume at my earliest opportunity oh uh, yeah so I, I let me ask you then have you watched uh dark the the german sort of time travel oh. horror thing on netflix I I saw some of it because my wife watched the series. Yeah. And you know, I I I checked in on it once in a while. Mm -hmm. but it's not something it's not light. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's, you can't just bop in and out of it. You got to watch from from oh, beginning to end. Back somewhere around here I, I actually had to build a family tree so i could keep track of all the characters <laughs> all through it. I'm like going, wait a minute, they connect here and how and i mean um but you were what I saw, I could tell it was great. It was yeah, you know, it's a really involved. fascinating show, and I think that's one of the things though is that it, it's it's again it's very character driven, and the you know the the one thing you were saying about people sort of deteriorating as they're faced with these things. Uh, are are you a fan of like Norwegian police dramas? Because most of those involve watching a cop just be destroyed by the end of his career. Yes, I have a few of those in my queue. I know I've watched one or two. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, they, they really go for it, which is great. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I would never be a police officer or a detective in like Norway or somewhere. That clearly is the worst job on the planet. Those people are just ruined by the end of their career. I, I'm hoping it's nothing like that. And this is pure imagination. <laughs> I you know. really hope so. <laughs> yeah, it's just them trudging, trudging through bleak landscapes, going to look for bodies. It's it's not great. I know it's always cold and wet and gray. <laughs> <laughs> 
and just horrible, horrible people hiding. <laughs> right. That's, that's it. That's exactly what it is. They're like going out to these sad farms out in the middle of nowhere with gray skies looking for bodies and killers. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess that would do you in eventually. So um, now I do know that you've written three novels, right? So you've written the two novels, of the, which are the Alexander Smith novels and the of the Lightning Wars, the Red Cape. But you've written a lot of short fiction as well. Mm hmm. And, you know, I'm sort of wondering when you write short fiction, I mean, do you have a, a preference is one or more to the point is one easier or one harder for you? Like some authors are just like, oh, my God, don't make me write a short story. It'll kill me. I don't have enough room to tell my tale. You know, where do you fall on that spectrum? Um, I, I do enjoy writing short stories and I don't find it dreadful at all. Mm -hmm. um, which I know is is maybe a little unusual. I don't mind hitting a three thousand to five thousand word count mm -hmm. with some little idea. Um, writing a novel is dreadful <laughs> because that's like <laughs> writing writing twenty five short stories that all connect. <laughs> and that's that's basically how I think of it. Like oh, like the the first chapter in All the Dead Men, which is the second book in the series, the first chapter is constructed like a short story. Mm -hmm. So it, that's usually a preview here and there, and, and it takes place in Alexander's past. And um, yeah, so it, it, I, I, it's not so much that I love short stories or I prefer them. I just find them easier to write uh, right. if, if I have an idea. And it, what's really funny is, is on the occasion that I'll get invited to something um, like the bad book, like I have a story in the bad mm -hmm. book. And very early on when I started you know, oh, before you go on, we'll tell folks what the bad book is. I don't, I don't, oh, I don't, okay, may I'm not sorry. know, right? <laughs> the bad book is an anthology edited by John F.D. Taft, and I hope mm -hmm. you're familiar with that name. Excellent writer, excellent editor. Mm -hmm. Um, the theme of the anthology is sort of a twisted version of the good book, right? Mm -hmm. So, all the stories are inspired by parables from the Bible, mm -hmm. so everybody's found their own parable and then inverted it into something horrible. Right. Um, and when John asked me, um, so when I first started meeting more senior people who were writing, and so one, one of the bits of advice that stuck in my head was like, if somebody asks you to do something, right, mm -hmm. they're inviting you to write something, just say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, barring that they're not incredibly horrible, that they don't have terrible reputation, right, sure. right, those types of things, but, but just say yes. And there's two or three times that, that I've been asked and, and I, my mind is just blank where I said yes. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do, you know, because I'm not um, some people I know uh, are very familiar with the Bible and, and they really play with these ideas a lot. And I don't. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But it turned out to be a really good time writing that. Uh, the uh, I did. Uh, well, what's it called? The uh, um, Parable of the Talents. Mm hmm. Um, which on my reading was something like a, 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 it was essentially, in my opinion, like it's like a slave story. Um, mm. It's a slave to capitalism. It's, it's being, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, indentured to rich people. And, you know, I love revenge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so this seemed like a perfect opportunity to do something like that. Right. Uh, it also happened with, um, monarchies of Mao. I always told myself I'll never write in someone else's property, mm -hmm. right? someone else's universe. I'll never do it. Uh, in fact, I think it was Mel. Yes, it was Melanie. She's she asked All if right. I would contribute a story. And I was like, Melanie Metters, an editor. <laughs> yes, I said, I said OK. <laughs> I had no idea what I'm going to do because I always said I would never do this. But, you know, right. all the materials and stuff. And um, I had the idea of doing a mystery and and having a weird mystery with the uh, characters that are Sherlockian, like the main characters, you know, sort of a Sherlock Holmes, a female uh, version that's also a cat. And, you know, this Mao is an <laughs> RPG um, that's related to the uh, Pugmire RPG. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Except this is the cat version of it. And, you know, I love cats. And I was like, all right, uh, uh -huh. off we go. Um, so it was it was it happens. <laughs> yeah. But it's easier for me to generate these things as long as I have an idea. And, you know, I, I could be talking with somebody saying, no, I don't have any idea. Oh, I just had an idea. I'll, let me see what I can do. You know, that's interesting. I think a lot of people don't realize that 
when a short story anthology like that is put together, it isn't always a case where they're just getting stories sent to them and they pick the ones they like. It's almost always someone saying, I got this idea for a theme. And then they go out and ask people and say, hey, do you want to write a story about circuses? Right. And the person, like you said, if they've been trained, they go, yes, I do. Right. <laughs> yes. my, first, my first short story I got published was for a, a cat anthology. I'm not a cat person. I've never been a cat person. But they said, it's about talking cats. Are you interested still? And I went, yes, yes, sure. I am. I would love to write a story about talking cats. I'm in, you know, and then, you know, it is a challenge though sometimes. Have you ever found yourself just like, you know, when you get in the theme and you've agreed to do it and you go home and you're like, oh my God, I don't know how I'm going to do this. It's such a challenge to figure yeah. out where to go with it. Yeah. Uh, Fright Train was an anthology where, it, you know, it's basically a horror anthology, but it takes place. It has, you have to have it take place on a train or it involves trains somehow. Right. And uh, it's edited by, by a few people and they call themselves a switch house gang. And I had no idea, you know, what I was going to do. I, I had nothing. And like for a long time, I had nothing. I'm like a train, a train. And, you know, I started to think about um, when I got married, we took a train across the United States as our honeymoon. Oh, uh, wow. It was a lot of fun. So I have <laughs> sort of this depth of experience with being on a train for an extended amount of time and in a sleeper car. And mm -hmm. the story just kind of wound out from there. Um, and uh, I had a lot of fun with that one. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the challenges that sometimes comes up is, you know, you're talking about the trains and you start thinking about it and go, well, now I have to actually know what I'm talking about when it comes to trains, because some train fans going to read this and they're going to be completely disappointed if I get it wrong. I mean, one time yeah. I crashed a, a ship in a sailing anthology just so that I wouldn't have to deal with the sailing parts because I was like, <laughs> I don't have time to learn it all. I'm just uh, ship's broken. They're going to go to shore. You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah. This there are definitely some tricks to getting around things like that. Like I, what what trips up people, I think, the most when they're writing uh, stories that involve the police or criminals or you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that is guns. And yeah. you know, a lot of people feel compelled. A lot of folks feel compelled to to be very specific about this gun. Yeah. And like you, you really don't have to be because the more specific you try to get with it the more you're going to run into somebody who's like, mm, that's not how that works. You know? They know more than you do. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> like all you really need to know is, is it a revolver or an automatic? And that's it. Like just mm -hmm. call it a gun or a pistol or a handgun or something and move on. So a lot of things are right. like that. So, you know, I have this experience on the train, but I don't know how trains work. <laughs> right. You know, I don't know how the the, uh, the personnel operate things or what's happening behind it. And I didn't even look into it because it had nothing to do with the story. So well, see, and that's just it. It's that if if you're able to stay away from it, you're OK, right? Because yeah, you fine. wrote about the piece that, you know, right? you've been on a long train trip. A lot of people have not And that's, again, right. the sort of thing where you're able to sort of draw on that. And yeah. now it's interesting as people are like, write what you know. It's like, well, I write horror with monsters and supernatural elements. I mean. Yeah. You know, how do you use that adage when you're writing about superheroes and and horrible exactly. supernatural things? Yeah. yeah, what you know are people. What we all know. We know ourselves, yeah. right? We know our innermost thoughts. And if you have an imagination, you can imagine what other people are thinking, what their motivations might be. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and it helps to read things, <laughs> to read <Yeah>. lots of <laughs> other stories. <laughs> And just to read nonfiction work, especially. Um, I right. found nonfiction work about history or sociopolitical issues to be very insightful in terms of behavior and decisions, uh, how how people kind of go about those things, how they really went about them, and then yeah. twisting them, you know, to my needs. Right. Well, I think that that's one of the, the things that's challenging is sometimes you start reading actual stories and you're like going no one will believe me if i write this if i write right. this they're gonna think it's ridiculous they're gonna come back and go no that doesn't work they, uh, no one will believe that happened yeah there's like, lot, lots of things that have happened in the last couple of years it's like if anybody wrote this nobody would believe it yeah, <laughs> seriously <laughs> no one would buy it they're like all in a two-year period no yeah nah. no i don't buy it you're, no. you're going too far no <laughs> you know the uh, uh blood for the sun the first time i was shopping that around um one of the comments that I got back was that it was happening in too brief a period. It happens over 
three to five days. Like that's mm -hmm. too, it's like too fast as you know, you've got this 80,000 word book that had, takes place over, over five days. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I mean, this, this, this <laughs> novels of this length that take place over a day. Like, what are you, where's right. that coming from? So, eh, you know, so yeah, this be reasonable, but yeah, you can be surprised by what's possible. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, one of the things that's true, though, I found about writing is that people just write whatever they really love, right? At the end of the day, there's no magic storyline to write. There's no perfect formula for what will or won't sell. I mean, if you look at what's become popular out there, you see that, right? You see that yeah. it just magically sort of like you hit the right tone and people pick it up and it works. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I uh, recently, like literally last night, I finished watching The Wire for the first time. Like I, mm -hmm. I never watched it because I'd never had HBO until <laughs> recently. Yeah. And um, I watched the last episode last night and it's, you know, sort of universally considered to be a great show. And mm -hmm. David Simon and his partner have written more things than that, um, which are also good work, but they haven't hit like The Wire. And it's like, you know, lightning lightning struck with that story yeah you know it'll it'll strike again but it won't be the same yeah so you know more good work but but not that you know you'll never get that back yeah. again but you got to keep plugging away because it's not the first thing they wrote you know they've done other stuff but the wire was the first thing that really took off and i think a lot of people try would want to be able to analyze and know what the answer is too right it's you know i'm yeah. a firm believer in the value of things like obviously because i ran one writer symposiums i think there's a lot to inspire you and to learn and to get ideas but at the end of the day it's just sort of guidance right it's not a magic formula that if you do it yeah. boom it'll all work out for you yeah yeah no kidding i think there was one either one panel or just one hotel room where a conversation uh, happened about like, you know, where everybody was just talking about their, their worst ideas, you know, like uh -huh. how many ideas go into the bin because you're like, I'll never get that to work or it's stupid right. or whatever. But you, like, you kind of have to go through all, you got to wade through all that stuff to, to get to something that works for you. Yeah. If it works yeah. for you. Yeah. You can create it. And if you can create it, eventually you'll find somebody else that thinks it's pretty good too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you were talking about shopping your book around. And I yeah. think a lot of folks would probably wonder what that looks like, right? What does it look <laughs> like to say shop around your book? Or what did it look like? More to the point, what did it look like for you? Because it's going to be different for everybody. But what did your yeah. experience look like? Um, when I first wrote that and started, I didn't know very many people in the business. Um, so it was a lot of cold uh, work where you're just, mm -hmm. you know, um, at the time there was a book that everyone referenced for agents. Mm -hmm. So I was for agents and publishers and I was, you know, sort of blind sending it to a lot of different people. Um, Back in the, in the ancient times before Atlantis sank beneath the sea, there was a literal <laughs> book with addresses in it that you would use. I used to have, yeah. I know which, I know the book of which you speak, this yeah. ancient tome. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were the last ones to use it because mm -hmm. you know, the internet took over after that. Exactly right. Which is great. You know, it's, yeah. there's, there's yeah, nothing yeah. wrong with that. The point is the the process is, I, I don't want to say easier, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's, um, it's probably a little simpler to yeah. use Google and to reverse engineer that information from books that you enjoy. So, you mm -hmm. know, you can look at books that you enjoy and figure out who the agents were and what other work that they have all on the internet. And so that's great. But the process was tedious. It's slow. And it was, mm -hmm. it was exhilarating to actually have, uh, to get a response, right? Like I got one person to say, Hey, yeah, send that whole thing over to me. Right. And, and you know, and then off we went for a little while. Um, but after that, I got to know more and more people um, that do these things uh, and finding out how many more publishers there were out there and how many more people that you could work with. And you can sort of find your own niche, but you, you do have to work at it and you do have to meet a lot of people. Um, yeah. And I, the, I, no, I, I just keep coming back to like this key thing, right? This sort of two key things like you, you have to write. Right. You, there's no point talking to people about getting your stuff published if you don't have anything to publish. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
And um, with that, you need to be able to, you know, condense it down to that quick pitch, the elevator pitch. You know, you, oh, yeah. you need to be able to say that to somebody. And if they're interested, they'll talk to you more about that. The other thing was it it seemed very important to me that you not be a psychopath. <laughs> 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 you know, it's, you, you meet a number of people and you're basically demonstrating that you can be professional and um, uh, reliable. And, you know, yeah. if they do ask for something that you can, you can, like I said, be a professional about it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You move on because that's what adults do. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, you're, you're going to be burning a lot of bridges if you're like, how, how dare you not read my work or something like that you know? mm -hmm. it, it took years for me to crack um a couple of people that i really i really appreciated their input and the things that they did but they don't know me you know mm -hmm. they had to get to know me enough to know that i'm not going to you know walk in and start throwing gasoline and matches everywhere yeah right well and that's the thing is that for a lot of times people think of of the arts as artistic <laughs> but the reality is that there's a business underlying this mm -hmm. just like in any of our jobs you know if you if you are not a professional it's yep. going to impact you negatively and i think that to so people don't worry because one of the things i found is that after the symposium people are like how do i not get blacklisted i'm like well you don't do things like you know i mean you have the if it sounds horrifying and it makes you gasp those are the things you shouldn't do. If you just call someone too many times because you're really nervous about when, they'll just tell you not to call anymore. It's okay. You, they, right. You're never going to blacklist you for, for calling right. to see what they received, right? Yeah. You, know? you try, but try reasonably and try professionally. Exactly. And, and don't get worked up about rejections. There's, <laughs> mm. You're going to get rejected a lot and you're going to get accepted a lot. And you get better the more that you try. If you don't try, you're not going to get anywhere. Did you ever end up in places where... You just sat there and thought to yourself, God, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this to myself? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. I denied myself this for a long time mm -hmm. uh, because I, you know, I, I wrote my first novel, geez, in like the late 90s, but I didn't do anything with it. Yeah. And I got laid off in like the mid 2000s. And in that period of a few years, I was working for myself, I was just doing freelance design work. And I, I had a little list of things that, you know, I've always wanted to try this, I should try it, you know, yeah. and writing the novel was one of those things. And I did it. You know, and it, it actually sitting down and getting something done from beginning to end is very satisfying, whether it gets published or not, you've proven to yourself that you can accomplish that step yeah. <laughs> and you know everything else is improvement from there so uh no i mean yes and no you know i denied yeah. myself for a long time and you know uh, uh but now it's it, it is an added burden's not the right word because i have a job and a family and other responsibilities and stuff right but, right you know, i'm doing this kind of in the margins or with you know at night and on weekends and wherever i can mm -hmm. grab an hour or two uh, but it's very satisfying personally yeah it's funny when you're talking about doing it in the margins that's the reality for most creatives right most yeah. creatives are doing their work and i think that's i love that that's a great way to say it we're doing it in the margins because the main story is right here in the middle and that's the day job and that's the yeah. family and that's mowing the lawn and all the things that you just can't get away from yeah um <laughs> it, it, and i think that sometimes people think that if they're not doing it solely that that's somehow an indication of success or failure and yeah. i think that's just not how this works and that's how the creative life works yeah like i've seen people get really obsessed with the word count or uh, oh mm -hmm. i don't write every day i'm a failure and it's like mm -hmm. it helps if when you write that you actually feel like doing it yeah. and it helps if you get a page done you know if you can if you can crank out uh, uh three thousand words every time you sit down and write in 20 days, you'll have a novel, you know, but mm -hmm. that's not everybody can do that. And that's okay. Yeah. You know, for me, it takes much longer <laughs> because I just don't have the time to do that stuff all the time. You don't always have the desire either. So speaking of finding the time to, to work on things, I do have a question about your Alexander Smith novels. That's a trilogy, 
right? There's going to be a third one at some point down the road. Am I right in saying that or not? There is. Um, I've had uh, since finishing this second one. Uh, I mean, in my head, I have so much more. But since finishing the second one, I, I crafted the the outline for it so that when I went back to it, I could just get started. Mm -hmm. And I pulled it up the other day and I, and I realized I didn't do the ending. I didn't have an ending. <laughs> <laughs> So, minor detail, you know. Yeah, minor detail. So I figured out the ending, and and I've actually written a couple chapters in it uh, already. Um, uh, it's, I'm hoping it'll be titled "The Headless Woman," unless you know my publisher tells me otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's going to take Alexander to New Orleans, uh, a city he hates. I love. He hates, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and it's tied to his past because his father escaped from slavery from new orleans and they had Ooh. horrifying plantations there and stuff but yeah. that's how he goes up the mississippi into uh into canada and that's how alexander ends up coming into existence he's born in canada um hmm. so yeah that's that's a good time it's slow going because the first two books take place in boston where i grew up yeah i'm very intimate with the city i'm not so intimate with new orleans so i, I kind of keep stopping to look things up or figure out like oh are we going are we going north or south or west or east or, and what's there and what's over right. there and what's a good because i you know i try to ground it as much in reality as possible and then yeah. twist from there so but then yeah, you have working on it you got an excuse though now you have to go to new orleans and write it off because it's a business trip you have no <laughs> choice right i mean no choice pretty much you have to do it your publisher insists <laughs> so uh <laughs> um one of the things that, you know, someone was asking right now, I just spotted this in our comments. They were saying that, you know, the idea of starting off with this really old character is an interesting choice. Like what sort of drove you to say, I want to tackle somebody who's been around for a much longer time than pretty much anyone I can even reference in real life. Like what yeah. brought you to that? Star Wars. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, members of... Uh, I, I'm assuming our generation were yeah. very young when Star Wars came out, uh, 1977. I remember going to see that movie nine times mm -hmm. you know, from 77 <laughs> to 78, and I would beg everyone to take me there. And, you know, over the years, the other two movies came out and, you know, was very connected to it as a kid. Um, and then it become, you know, I start to realize that this is a middle of the story, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those three movies take place smack dab in the middle of something more broad. And I've just always liked the idea of being in the middle of a story. So here's this character who's very long lived. I know what his future is going to be, and he's got a mm -hmm. past. Um, but the story is taking place now, and it gives the opportunity to mine a lot of things from the past and uh, a lot of places to go. And that's part of the reason why I did the what's essentially the first chapter of the second book is a short story it takes place in alexander's past mm -hmm. so I, I just love the idea of being able to just dive into the past and 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 uh add or add all kinds of things or jump off of different ideas from them so that's where that's that came a, from i like that because we're really i mean we're the sum of our experiences right and yeah. if we haven't had those experiences it's you sort of the, you don't really have as much of a foundation to build off of having this sense that there are all these things that have happened in the character's past definitely gives you a different feel than sort of starting fresh and like, Hey, I just, I'm a blacksmith and I'm 13 and I'm leaving home, you know, Hey, yeah. you know, that's a very different sort of character versus one where it's like, what brought them to that point? What are those experiences? And we don't know that we meet people and we see mm -hmm. the outcomes of those experiences, but we don't know what they are. Yeah, and, and uh, I think it's really interesting. I also got a kick out of, you know, uh, giving him memory issues means that there are incidents in his past mm -hmm. that he doesn't recall. So one of the things that happens in the first book is he meets somebody from his you know, deep past um, from 40 or 50 years ago, and he doesn't remember them or what they're connected to until yeah. he sees them and it comes back. So that's fun, too. <laughs> you know, that's something I always think about in, in books with immortals or people who live hundreds of years, all I can think is that you wouldn't remember anything. You'd be like, oh, I don't know. I mean, maybe I lived at, I guess maybe I lived in London at one point. Yeah. Yeah. I, 
I can't remember all my addresses now. <laughs> you know, it's you know, security checks and stuff like that. It's anything that uh -huh. has to do with credit reporting. They're like, you know, where were you in 19, you know, 92? And I'm like, I'm not too sure. I'm really not too sure. <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, if I had email, I could go back and look, but I didn't. I have no clue. Yeah. Yeah. That, that would be the real vampire story. So vampires all sit around going like, I don't know. I got you know, movie instead. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we are just about out of time. But before we stop, there's something I always like to do is I like to try to take an opportunity to sort of boost other folks who are out there that are creating really cool stuff. You have somebody that you were going to tell us about today, correct? Yeah. Uh, John Goodrich. So these are two of his books. Uh, yeah. Hag and I Do Terrible Things. Um, he's got an, another novel, a more current novel that's out now. But um, I met John, I don't know, I, I guess it's over a decade ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's he's very much into the uh, the cosmic horror mythos. And he, he's my guy whenever I have to, I know nothing about it, so I'll have to I have to talk to him about it and say, hey, man, yeah. here's this idea I have. Does anything work, you know, with this idea? Is there anything that will feed into it? You know, um, so he's, he's got a, a very a weird cosmic horror background, but he, he writes some some <laughs> really great horror, I think, and, and deserves more attention. Yeah. All right. Well, definitely. Folks should check out John Goodrich then. And, you know, if it's cosmic horror, I'm sure you'll have some names with. 20 or 30 consonants in it that you have to try to figure out how to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> but that sounds great. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you stopping by to hang out with us for a little while today. Um, it was great to talk to you folks. Definitely check out um, Eric's books. There's some great stuff there for you. Um, let me just take a look. I think that that's all that I've got for today. Again, Thanks again. It's been great having you on board and uh, hopefully we can have you back again sometime. I, I'd appreciate that. I Thank you. I, it was a great conversation. I enjoyed myself for sure. All right. Well, thank you. All right. That's it for this week, folks. Next week, we are talking to the extremely talented Crystal Sully. Her work has appeared in products for Dungeons and Dragons, Magic the Gathering, Star Wars, Critical Role, and more. She's an amazing artist. Uh, absolutely can't wait to talk to her. So I hope that you'll join us. That's it for tonight. I appreciate you guys stopping by and we will see you next time.